Welcome to the Athlete Brand Advisor Podcast. Featuring advice and interviews about athlete branding. Learn how marketing, public relations, and broadcasting can grow your brand. We also have special episodes to talk about recent news, events, and anything in the world of sports. The podcast is sponsored by Pliable, a versatile marketing, PR, and broadcasting company that identifies opportunities and creates tailored content for its clients. Now it's time to roll. Here's your host, Greg Glenn. Thanks and welcome to the Athlete Brand Advisor Podcast. In this episode, we're talking about athletic administration and sports management. As we come to you here today, we are with Monique Smith. As we get ready for this episode, Monique's really going to be able to share a lot of cool ideas and ways that athletes can use their athlete brand to get into athletic administration. She's a leadership strategist, and she's also part of Seeds of Empowerment. She's going to talk all about that. And she guides athletic departments and sports organizations and individuals who wish to advance in athletics, administration, and sports management careers. And her company, Seeds of Empowerment, LLC, she is a sports management veteran of over 30 years. Welcome to the podcast, Monique. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited you're with us because there's so many athletes out there that are always looking to advance their career. And I think that getting into athletic administration and getting into some of these colleges after they're done, even at their current college, is such a great way to do that. Let's talk about your career. How did you get into, you know, the position you are in today? Well, it started out in the eighth grade. I was a scorekeeper in the eighth grade. Um, and so I knew that, uh, the way a game brings community together, because I'm from a small town. And so I'm a person who's like promoting things. And so it was interesting in the eighth grade year, fast forward to my sophomore year in college, I majored in PR. And so there was a, a, a little sticker on top of the bulletin board that said, looking for CIAA PR interns. CIAA is Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, a Division II uh, conference at that time had 12 institutions. This is 1988, and uh, I answered that call. I was one girl among three guys for interns, um, and so it was interesting because I knew what to do. I mean, I had Tony Masterberg. We went to high school together. He played for Maryland. Right. I had to put his stats together for Lefty Giselle when he was being recruited. Right. So I mm-hmm. knew what all this was. And so fast forward my senior year, they told me St. Paul's College was looking for a sports information director and I should apply. And I did. So my first full time job straight out of college at 22, 23 was sports information director for St. Paul's College, a member of the CIAA. Uh, and my role there in eight years, I went from being an SID. I was a senior when was administrator. I became interim athletic director at 28 years old. So I had to learn quick, fast, in a hurry. Yeah. I remained in that role for two years. And then I uh, did Division One compliance. And then the CIAA said, come on back home. Um, and so I did. I was the PR director for the CIAA, then director of championships then director of governance, and then essentially chief of staff. I was there for 13 years. And the last 10 years, I've been a consultant. Wow, that's that's a really incredible story to go from scorekeeper, uh, you know, to where you went. And it just obviously speaks to your passion. What makes you so passionate about the work that you do? It is the leadership piece. It's seeing uh, when you're promoting a student, it was really exciting because back in those days, I would write the story. And then I would send it and it would be published. And just to see the young people be so excited to see their name in print in their hometown. So beyond just where St. Paul's was, I was able to give them something that they did not have. And so, uh, but, you know, like if anything, to get to this point, you've got to know the steps in the process. And so it became, I was waiting to see who was going to be eligible to play. And I got tired of waiting. 
So I went <laughs> and learned yep. how to certify student athletes for eligibility. And as you know, leadership, people gravitate to people who get things done. And that has always been me. And so that's really where I am. I've always had a tendency uh, to look ahead and to be able to uh, see the trends and prepare where I am, institution, organization, to meet uh, where we're going. And so um, I'm an avid reader. Um, and so preparing our young people, uh, you build trust by understanding what's important to them. And then you can train their minds to be able to see things. It just, it's really interesting. To, kids today are so apprehensive about making a mistake. They don't want to try, you know? And so I'm, I, it, it, to me, a leader is being curious. You know, taking risks, but calculated risks mm. to see if it's going to work out and and to go and do that. And so I'm trying to, in my role as a consultant, in my role as a as an adjunct professor and and hiring young people to work basketball tournaments. I worked at Boo Williams uh, in his uh, sports plex. And that's why it gives me joy to be able to teach and then be able to see them execute. And then show them. I said, look, that banner right there is not hung correctly. You know, that's really like $5,000 that's being messed up over there. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. important yeah. to make sure that stick is in the middle and there's not a crease in it. And it's like, oh. So to me, just the leadership part of it is leading people to the next at this point. Wow, that's great. I love hearing that because I think there are so many opportunities, especially with name, image, and likeness uh, for athletes to take that calculated chance or that opportunity. Um, and I wanted to kind of talk with you, obviously, being in the world of administration, uh, when did you learn kind of about name, image, and likeness that it was going to happen? And and what do you see as kind of the next frontier for name, image, and likeness? Well, I have to tell you, I'm an old, as the kids say, I'm an OG. You know, <laughs> so it's hard to uh, um, to train old G's in new ways. But I do know if you don't get on this train, um, you won't be able to assist those who are already on the journey. And so for me, uh, it was like, no, no, you don't want to do that. And so uh, because. It's, it really is the Wild Wild West because you're talking to somebody who served on several, several, several NCA committees. And so I know the process. And it's interesting enough, people don't really realize it's not a, it's not, it's, it's, it's really like, like Congress. You know, you have a committee of people, but the people change every year because of different people sitting in the committee. And so depending upon what's important to them, what part of the region they are in, what kind of influences they have. Because you do know name, image, and likeness happen in the uh, state houses. It did not happen right. in a college setting in higher ed. It happened to say, well, we're going to make this right. Well, and that's one reason why you have a new NCA president that doesn't come from higher ed. He comes from the governance piece. Yeah. And so uh, it's a lot of educating needs to go on to influence decision makers. And that's what I've always been able to do is try to educate influencers to be able to, to influence the decision maker. So my thoughts on that is that um, our higher ed people need to become good friends with those who are making these votes. You got to educate them not based on what they see by watching television, okay? Not by, oh, these kids need to have. You see what's happened with the kids need to have. These kids with these big deals don't even go to class anymore because it's not safe for them to go to class. You know, so what you think you're doing is helping without giving resources. So, you know, institutions are requiring, um, this, it it kind of goes into to hand. You know, mental health is really big. Mm -hmm. So name, image, and likeness, let's just say you a lineman, okay? And you're not getting deals. But we all know 
it takes the lineman to make the quarterback <laughs> look good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're not mature enough, how do you think that's going? That's working out. How do you think that's working out within the system? Unless somebody in administration is trying to, I can't say level the playing field, but it takes a lot more administration to protect the kid with the name, image, and likeness deal, being able to have everybody still work together. Now, you know in the workplace this happens, but we're dealing with mature individuals yep. who already have signed a contract. Yep. And they know what they need to do to improve their income. It's not anywhere near that. We're not even close to that. So where I am, I, you know, that, that that's the administrative standpoint. All right. For the student athlete. Okay. I just read a very interesting article about the, was it Kelsey Travis, the guy from Kansas City? His oh, brother. yeah. Travis Kelsey. Yeah. Okay. And the guys that have put, I mean, it, 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 it's not by design that everybody just woke up and they just like this guy. It, it was a plan to put him in front of different individuals like three years ago. And now he's blown up. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So our kids, when they see that, and it wasn't just, uh, and this is what I, I thought was interesting. They said they did not look to just put him where people were already getting NFL players. They look for entities that were of interest to him and were unique to him. And I think for name, image, and likeness, if our student athletes look at it upon that, I think it's a hotbed for hometown connections. Yeah. You know, no longer would you get in trouble if, if your local um um, let's say ho- sub ho- shop, ho- car dealership, right. yeah, the whole nine yeah, yards. Wants to assist you as long as you have somebody to write it up and, and you, you're straight. I yeah. got a young man, I said, Look, I know you don't wear suits, but I bet you you can make a nice little deal, wear some suits, take some pictures, and put it on social media, and you won't, you won't be hungry this year, you know. So if you take control of it instead of waiting for somebody to fall into your lap. That's where I see a problem. Yeah, no, and I think that's another good point, too. I always say that there is such an opportunity in your hometown. I think that comes from our PR background, Monique. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you realize that that's where the stories are, right? That's where Mm -hmm. the people are that are very much invested in you and I want to support you, that kind of thing. So I always look at it like, boy, if you're going to go do that, that's where you need the help. That's where I really come in as, you know, a marketing agent and help a lot of these athletes in their hometowns. I do these athlete outreach tours where I will bring them into that restaurant or bring them to that car dealership and say, hey, this is who this is. You know who he is or her or her, she is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We remember you. You know, And then it all the conversation starts. It clicks. Yeah, it just clicks. And uh, that's what's really special for me is to be able to bring that magic uh, to some of these athletes that really deserve it. I mean, that they, it's been a long time coming. Uh, but I always also emphasize, you know, following the rules, right? So there's yes. also, you know, all the compliance stuff, which you're very familiar with. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I've been talking with people and we've said how it's the wild, wild west. But right now, from a compliance standpoint, uh, we've got it where the schools really aren't allowed to um, encourage or induce these partnerships. They haven't really been able to take on a role of educating as much as they probably could or should. And then they're also put in a very difficult spot because they then are the ones who have to enforce the compliance around if an athlete is going to use the logo and marks of the school to then slap them on the wrist or try and tell them you can't do that. And so they're in this very weird spot. So I'd love to hear your thoughts as being in compliance, uh, what that's like. Well, I, you know, my last role was a conference office for 13 years, so I have not been hands on. But uh, I've have I have served um, as a moderator for panels with athletic administrators of recent to educate on NIL. And so one of the things is the fact that you can embrace your student athlete with the logo and with items that does curve some of the stress of saying no, 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 but you can have parameters. Oh, you can't wear this with this, you know, uh, and that, that will probably ease some of that, but also assist there to be a partnership between the athlete 
and their yeah. name likeness with the institution. I mean, that's free publicity. But you got to be able, you know, you can't even or even like name, image, and likeness in some states because that's the thing. Name, image, and likeness uh, rules are based on state yeah. of where the institution is, not where the student is. So there has to be some, again, constant education with that. So, you know, generally all states, you can't have alcohol and you can't have tobacco and things like that. You can't endorse those things. But you still have to educate that because guess what? We have people in the, um, in the locker room when we win a championship smoking cigars. So, you know, the kids are confused. You know, I thought we couldn't or can't we and how come? So it's a constant thing of educating. Yeah, no, I think you I think you've brought up a lot of good points, uh, especially as, you know, people get influenced and people learn more about name, image and likeness. Obviously, two and a half years in here now, uh, as we go into 2024, uh, what are what are some of the advice you might have for an athlete that wants to get into athletic administration and maybe a way to kind of work their way to the top? Most importantly is to volunteer. Hmm. Volunteer. I mean, internships are so important because you can learn what you don't want to do. <laughs> and I <laughs> That's think, true. Yeah. oh my goodness, I interned at BET, at my local uh, TV station here. I, I didn't like, my, my creativity does not work well in 24 hours. You know? And so slogans come to me in my sleep. And so those type of things, I got to be able to uh, be able to control what I can control. Let's be honest, I'm a control freak. And so if I'm going to be a PR person to control the narrative mm-hmm. versus somebody coming to me, and I tell people all the time, when they come to interviews, you pick your three points you want to say, no matter what they ask you. Because I, I noticed uh, I, I'm associated with Hampton University. I was as an adjunct. And so I had the students, I had like maybe 30 football players and they were, and I have interns now with Boo Williams that are football players. And I said, and it just kept saying, well, they tried to trip me up and they tried to do, I said, well, did you know, decide what you're going to say before they put the mic in front of your face? So that young man just did a whole three day basketball tournament, 40 teams. And, you know, he just kept coming back to me and saying, well, how do I do? I said, take the words out and you design how you can put them out. You, you can't mess it up. You know, it's going to be okay. You know, I'll be right. standing near you. And that's how I learned. I intern, I work. I think I had like four or five different internships, but because people saw my work ethic, they said, you need to go for the sports formation job. They did not have football, but they did have volleyball. And no one in the whole conference was doing volleyball stats. So that's the second thing. Volunteer, number one. Number two, do what no one else wants to do. And so for me, being one of the first to do computerized volleyball stats after doing it manually uh, in the 90s set me apart, you know. And so for the women that I have guided over the years, you know, one is the EADA report, which is Equity Disclosure Athletics Act, which shows you where the money is spent with the women's program versus the men's program. And it's called EADA. And that is where you can either, I'm taking it from the positive side, you can tell the true story of how you are um, um, accommodating your women's sports. For instance, you have a track coach. He coaches women and men. So although in the spreadsheet, in the accounting system, the little zebra sheets, he may be have a price of have a, a, a salary, but you need to divide it between men and women on this report because he's coaching both. Right. You know, but, you know, naturally you just put it on one and be happy. No, because it doesn't show the true, true nature of what you're spending. Because I'm talking about spending on your women's program by supplying resources. So that's when I, that's when I first started consulting in the 2000s. That's what I was consulting on. I said, we're not showing our true picture. But then when I did that, I could be able to educate. Oh, well, then, you know, well, why don't you go ahead and hire a woman over the women's program? So she can have uh, a woman over your, your track team. Okay. Oh, you don't have any women coaches. Did you notice that? So those type of things of what you do, because, again, nobody wants to do that. And I told, I would tell the women, I said, now you go ahead and do this report. Nobody else wants to do it. And then 
you do a presentation, not just to the athletic department, but to the business office, to the financial office, to the VP, and then they can see where they are. And guess what? Always, I want to say 98% of the time, they were able to find cost savings. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think also too, you know, I've always said this is that, you know, basically I feel like name, image, and likeness is the best thing to happen to college sports since title nine. If you're a female athlete, because now you've got a voice, now you've got an opportunity and now there's supposed to be obviously equality. uh, And we're not seeing a lot of it quite yet, but I think women's sports have a chance here to really emerge stronger and better than ever because of name, image, and likeness. Well, let me ask you this in your role, how many female athletes have sought your services? Well, I would say that it is heavily female, quite honestly, which is... I mean, for you, though. I mean, it sought you out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because, well, one of the things that I do, I also have Mission E50, which is I will always represent more than 50% female athletes. So I already work with females. Right, yeah. So they're they're, intentional. And that's what needs to happen. Yeah. The problem is, again, I'm going back to cycle sociology of sport. Yeah. Women are not socialized to be asked, they wait to be asked to dance. Men, yeah. they just go out and I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna do it and see what happens. When women are like, let me see. Now women Well, I actually mean, let, let me go back to, to to clarify something because you're right. I've mm-hmm. most of the time been the person who does the reaching out. Right. It's it's You're not intentional. The, yeah, yes, right. Yes, that's true. Yep. That's and that's point. what I'm saying. It has to be intentional. All right. Athletic department cannot. This is when they have to. This is when this this was allows them to step in. You cannot just sit there and wait to see how it's going to fall because you can't touch their image and likeness. Because what's going to happen? The Tower Nine is going to come back on you, even though yeah. you have any control of that. You have got to be able to educate your collectors, your boosters, or, or all your business people that you doesn't have to be equal, has to be equitable. Okay, there's a difference, and so the point is, is that you women traditionally don't go out and go go ask for it. Guys will traditionally people. Now I love it that the fan base is improving. We need to educate the fan base. To be able to utilize those dollars and those times to help the women out. You have now the thing is, you have women who have the most money, like the the, the highest deal. Right. But you have fewer women participating. And what I say is look in the mirror. Your hair, your glasses. I don't have lashes, my lipstick. You know what I'm saying? The books I read. You know? All of these things, you can go out and say, I could be influenced. Just yeah. very basic. But they don't think of that. And that's what I teach in class. And mind you, you know, when I jumped on this, I had um, at a class in the year presentation, young lady was on the basketball team. And she didn't even call it what it was. She heard it was, why are women athletes treated differently? So I'm sitting there watching her presentation. And she tells me that she's offered $100 a week to post about, it was like one of them drink drink stores. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But a guy on the basketball team, he was offered 200 Oh, my goodness. I was living. And this was like the end of the year, in the semester. Not end of the semester. It was like in the fall. I jumped on that thing. I was like, okay. So, and I could tell you. What was the impetus? She just took what was given to her. She didn't mm-hmm. she didn't negotiate. And then because she was friends with the basketball players, that's how she knew. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I had to educate her. And so then the next in that next the next fall, she says, Can you read over this contract? I said, well, you know, I work for the institution, right, really yeah, can, gonna, yeah. but I do have people that can review for you. But I can teach you what a basic good contract, contract looks like. Is. Okay? Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. And then one of the things it was, and then it was a guy who was, all this is after class, right? I right. never could leave a class because everybody was always waiting to see me. And I would say, okay, another guy was like, well, yeah, I'm getting this percentage. I said, so I didn't say that's what he was getting, all right? 
But there are certain things I said, what are the things that you want? And I, that's when I also said, who's doing the taxes? Yeah. You know, so I just think a basic, even if the NCA could just give a basic one of what should be in it, then we would have a template of what to be able to to look for. for yeah and i think that's going to be coming they've talked about standardizing contracts which will be interesting to see if they can get that done but that would um, be helpful that would be that would be really helpful i think uh make things a lot easier for a lot of a lot of different people so um let's also uh, finish up here um on advice that you have for athletes uh in this day and age uh to try and be successful whether it's during their career after their career you've talked a little bit about the mental health aspect uh, let's go for some advice from you. Well, I, I was we'll just finish up with, you know, you asked me, the first thing is to yeah. volunteer. The second one is to be able to stand out. All right. Stand out. And, and, and when you do these things, it builds your confidence. And I think that's where I see the most, even, even in guys, yep. you know, and I'm saying, test it out. You know, if we were scientists, we wouldn't be so quiet about it because we know you're going to try it again and try it again. Yeah. And, and it, it, it just, it just need to be like Einstein and just play around with it or Ben Franklin and see what happens. Um, just stay curious. I think that's what I would say. Yep. The number yep. three would be to stay curious and, uh, and it's okay because that's how, it, I mean, mind you, it was somebody who said, I want to try YouTube and I want to teach people how to kick the ball. And then he was told that's a no no that he has a decision to make. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with that decision. That decision changed the whole world. Yep, that's true. Uh let's go with how people can get in touch with you, learn more about what you do. Go ahead, share with us. Okay. Well, uh, I like to talk on LinkedIn. So my name is Monique A. Period J. Period Smith. Again, I, there are a lot of Smiths in the world. So this yeah, I was going to say, stand yeah. out. <laughs> well, I told you, I stand out. So that I stand Mon- out. Yeah, that's right. Monique A. Period J. Period Smith. And then um, I do have a book that does cover my athletic administrative journey. And it's called, uh, you can go get that at the uh, publicfiguremask.com. Yep. Publicfiguremask.com. It talks about my beginning journey in this business as a black woman in the 90s. And so uh, I'm really glad to be able to do that. And then as you, I think probably can't see, but I have uh, several magazines out on Amazon, Significance in Athletics and Sports. There are six issues uh, there. And then I, lastly, I have a podcast that I've had for a decade now where I interview um, actually this this month all it, black women who work in NFL. Wow, that's cool. Very yeah, it's nice. called, you can find us on uh, chatinthegarden.com. Chatinthegarden.com. Great. Well, I've I've uh, listened into that podcast. You guys do a great job. Uh, a lot of good energy. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and we'll also put uh, the link there that you just mentioned, the publicfiguremask.com. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes for everybody. Um, so thank you again, Monique, uh, for joining us and the really insightful information, obviously, in your position and your role as a leader uh, in this space to be able to uh, connect with you and share the education that we talk so much about um, that's so important about name, image, and likeness. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It's been a joy to be able to share. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. I'm Greg Glenn, and stay pliable, my friends. Thanks for listening to the Athlete Brand Advisor Podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes from today's episode and catch up on recent episodes at pliablemarketing.com. We also encourage you to share topics and guest ideas by emailing our production staff at pliablemarketing at gmail.com. We love hearing from our loyal listeners and athletes who want to grow their brand. So jump in and be part of the podcast because that's how we roll.